Good day. Welcome to the first APAS webinar update. As Brendan indicated, my name is Don Ross, APAS Client Relationship Consultant. And as you notice, Brenda is with us this morning, and she is instrumental in having this webinar up and operational. Our guest this morning is Mr. Norm Hall, President of APAS. Welcome, Norm. Initially, the purpose of this session was to provide an update on a variety of subjects following the December annual meeting. The Board of Directors and APAS staff have been extremely busy on a number of issues representing Saskatchewan producers. However, in the intervening months, one issue has arisen to the surface that affects virtually every producer, that being grain transportation. During his presentation, Norman will focus primarily on grain movement with brief mention of other issues in his, in his closing comments. That does not mean you cannot pursue other topics during the question and answer session if that is your preference. Clearly, this is about providing you with the information you need to be better informed about the issue and about APAS's activities on that particular topic. Bottom line, ask your questions on whatever topic is of, in of interest to you. To assist us in achieving that end, we encourage everyone to adhere to the following guidelines. First, if you are unclear, if you need further clarification, if you are unsure about what was or was not said, Please ask. Your questions are vital to engage and seek greater understanding. Secondly, please be succinct. That request is made of participants and of the speaker. Lastly, we are all here to learn and create greater understanding. Therefore, please respect the speaker, other participants involved in the webinar, and EPAS staff. Collectively, our objective should be able to leave this webinar with improved clarity and understanding than when we logged in this morning. In a minute, Mr. Hall will be introduced. Norm will review his presentation. There will then be a question and answer period. At the end of the question period, we'll have some brief comments following uh, from Mr. Hall and APAS. This update will end no later than 10 a.m. I will now introduce Mr. Hall. Mr. Hall and his brother farm in the Wynyard area. He is married and has three children. Norm has been and continues to be extremely active in his community, undertaking a number of different roles. Mr. Hall has been involved in APAS since, 19, in 20, pardon me, since 2003. He is now a District 4 Director and President of APAS. Again, thank you, Norm, for being with us this sunny morning. The podium is now yours, Norm. Thanks, Don. Um, okay, Brenda, how do I advance the slides? Huh. Anyway, uh, as, as Don mentioned, we are uh, the, the one issue that, that came up very loud and clear this year was transportation. Early on in, in, in the season, we uh, all right, that's what I was doing. Okay, there we go. Yeah. Early on, we uh, had uh, had seen that there were, were issues in the transportation uh, of grain, and and uh, so we got got in in contact with uh, Quorum Corporation which is the, the federal government's uh, uh, collector of data on, on grain transportation. And at the end of October, we were told that, that uh, the railroads are 20,000 cars behind or about 12.5% behind their own plan. Now, media got a hold of us and, and asked many times, about about the large crop and transporting the large crop and it, at no time did we ever say we want to see this whole crop disappear uh, uh, in short order what we said was that this crop needs needs to to uh, be delivered according to the contracts that, that were made the crop needs to be moved according to the ships that are in port. 
and and it needs to be moved according to the railroad's plan, which I might add was 5,000 to 5,500 cars per week each. And I will I will touch on that later. We started going to the media with with this message that that the railroads are behind on their own plan and and uh, and making noise about that. We started going to the politicians saying that this is unacceptable. Minister Ritz in in uh, through November and December said the railroads are doing an adequate job of moving crops to the market. Uh, in December at our annual meeting we had had the provincial government come in uh, and although Minister Stewart was called away on a family emergency we had had this, uh, Deputy Minister Alana Cook come in and when when we, we mentioned to her that that the uh, uh, September and October contracts were not moved by December. Her comment was that that we shouldn't expect to move all our crop in, in, in the fall. And the numbers that we had had from from Quorum Corporation about about the, the poor movement of the railroads suggested that that they were falling further and further behind. I believe in December they were getting closer to the 20% behind their own targets. And uh, we started working numbers about about the financial implication to to uh, producers, and and at that time prices were dropping severely too, and so we were seeing the Western Canadian discount, uh, and and the cost to both the farm economy and the provincial economy. In March of, of 2014, uh, uh, some numbers were done. Uh, uh, March 29th, Leader, Leader Post came out with some numbers, telling the the the, the loss in sales at between 7.2 and 8.3 billion dollars. Now going into into January, or all I guess all through December, as I said, the, the federal minister said that the the railroads are doing an adequate job. Going into January. Uh, the, the four Western Canadian uh, farm groups, Keystone Ag Producers out of Manitoba, APAS, the Alberta Federation of Agriculture, and uh, British Columbia Ag Council got together and, and through the previous months we had been talking, coordinating our, our message to, to uh, the media and to the federal government and to our provincial governments. But in, in January, we got together and wrote a letter to Minister Rayet, Transport Minister, uh, and we copied the letter to Minister Ritz, as well as the, the Prime Minister, saying that, that this situation was unacceptable. It is, it is, the railroads are harming our economy as a whole, not just the ag economy, but our provincial economies. Um, and through, through January, we also were planning uh, transportation symposiums. Uh, one for February 18th in Assiniboia, and the next for February 19th in Humboldt. On those two days, we had excellent speakers. We had excellent information. Uh, we, we brought in uh, Mark Hemis from the Corn Corporation to, to talk about the numbers. And and uh, and where the, where they are landing, uh, Wade Saab, which from the Western Grain Elevators Association, talked about about how how congested they were and some of the costs that they were running into, uh, be it uh, uh, demurrage at, at the port and and uh, the cost of, of uh, renewing contracts with with the uh, uh, purchasers of the grain. Uh, Jerry Galt from the Grain Workers Union Local 333 out of Vancouver, and uh, he talked about about the uh, the lack of grain that is coming out there, and and when it was coming, and and uh, how without without our grain coming to the west coast, they don't have jobs. 
So they they're willing to work any any time that that grain comes in. Lonnie McCaig from Redcoat Road and Rail talked about uh, what was happening with short lines and and uh, <clears throat> producer cars. And Paul Stoll from Omni Tracks, which is the owner of, of uh, Churchill and and uh, the Churchill line, and talked about about usage that he saw going up up to Omni Tracks or up to Churchill. Um, the conclusion from from these two meetings was that weekly grain shipments are falling behind, and Canada's reputation as a reliable grain supplier is faltering. There was one resolution that was passed at each of the two meetings. Uh, the resolution was that it resolved the federal government during the spring session of Parliament amend the Fair Rail Service Act in accordance with the six recommendations put forward by the Western Grain Elevator Association and the Coalition of Grain Rail Shippers. These were both moved and passed, or both moved and passed at both rail meetings. Uh, I'll step back to the rail meetings just for one second. Uh, you can view this as a conspiracy theory or just a coincidence, but at each of those meetings, uh, the day prior to the meeting, uh, the railroads spotted 100 cars at each town. So there was a noticeable uh, number of producers, local producers, that were not at uh, those meetings. So. Uh, as I said, be it coincidence or conspiracy theory, I'll leave that up to you. The following week was the, the annual meeting of the Confederate, Canadian Federation of Agriculture in Ottawa. Um, the, the meeting itself was only two days, but uh, Doug Fowler, uh, Todd Lewis, Arlen Kurtz, and myself went, went up to uh, Ottawa on Sunday night and uh, started started uh, a line of meetings that we had set up um, with MPs, uh, bureaucrats, and, and uh, other organizations <clears throat> while we were there. During the uh, CFA AGM, APAS and the Western Farm Leaders, as I said, the, the presidents of, of BCAC, uh, Alberta Federation of Agriculture, APAS, and CAP, um, moved resolutions that were adopted on grain movement, domestic and international, uh, and cash advance, moving the repayment deadline to September 15th, or September of 2015 from the current uh, September uh, 2014. As you know, the cash advances that are out there from last year's crop uh, are due September of, of uh, 2014, and we wanted the extra timeline because of the poor grain movement. Uh, the, the tone at the meeting uh, was, was grain movement, but uh, the, the undercurrent of, of all the discussion was a cash shortage. Uh, either your contracts weren't being moved on time, or, or uh, the, if you were able to get some later contracts, the price had dropped so much, that you're having to, to move twice as much grain just to get the same amount of cash flow. There we go. Oh, no, I'm too far. While in Ottawa uh, for the CFA meeting, APAS directors and the Western Farm leaders met, as I said, with a number of MPs, uh, bureaucrats, and, and uh, other organizations. Here's a list of, of some of those that, that we met with. <clears throat> uh, we had had a direct meeting with uh, Minister Rayet. Um, the 30-minute the 30, 30 meeting that we had scheduled turned into a full hour as, as we brought her up to, to speed on a number of, of issues uh, around, around the uh, grain transportation. Uh, APAS uh, executive met with, with Minister Ritz, but the minister had also made a presentation to the, to the uh, CFA body as well. We also set up meetings with, with party leaders. Uh, 
NDP leader Tom Mulcair and Liberal leader Justin Trudeau. We met with a number of, of uh, other MPs, uh, Deputy uh, Liberal leader Ralph Goodale from Saskatchewan, Kerry uh, Braithwaite from the Yorkton area, uh, NDP ag critic Malcolm Allen, Liberal ag critic Mark Eiking, and Saskatchewan MP Randy Holbach from the Prince Albert area. Um, a number of, of bureaucrats that uh, either in the Ag Department or Transportation Departments and other organization leaders. The first priority that we talked about was, was uh, the grain backlog, cash advances. Secondary issues were around uh, Indian Head, uh, tree nursery, agri-stability and agri-recovery, and generic chemicals. <clears throat> On March 7th, Minister Ritt and, and Minister Ritz announced the Order in Council. What the Order in Council uh, had within it was after four weeks after the announcement, so starting yesterday, the railroads are, are required to move up a minimum of 100 or 1 million tons per week or 5,000 to 5,500 cars per week. If you remember early in the presentation, I mentioned those numbers. That was their plan, to move 5,000 to 5,500 cars per week every week. Uh, so the government has really not asked the, the uh, railroads to do anything outside of what their plans were. By giving them the four weeks, they gave them time to get through the cold weather and so there is no reason that they cannot be moving that right now. But they also added in the penalty of up to $100,000 per, per day for non-compliance. Now $100,000 per day sounds like, like a lot to you and me, but the CEO of, of CP Rail, Hunter Harrison, his annual salary works out to $189,000 per day. So it's, it's uh, in retrospect, it's not a lot of money. And to a railroad that has billions in income, $100,000 per day is not a lot of money. We have asked for that, that number to be moved up uh, to at least a quarter million dollars per day. Uh, but uh, it's not looking like that's going to happen. Uh, the Order and Council also included weekly rail, railway reports to be submitted to, the, to Minister Rayet, and legislation was to be introduced. Now, a quote from Minister Ritz, the current grain logistics system is not meeting current demand, so they're, they're finally seeing that, that there, there are other needs. And Minister Rayet, we are taking this action uh, to more than double the grain shipments in order to preserve the integrity of Canada's transportation system and our reputation as a global supplier. On March 26th, uh, Minister, Ray, Minister Ritz did introduce legislation, Bill C-30, the Fair Rail for Farmers Act. This act amends the, the Canadian Transportation Act and the Canada Grains Act. Uh, it requires uh, the government requires volume requirements uh, for 24 months, after which there is a sunset clause. Uh, does that mean that we're looking at a backlog for the next two years or 24 months? Uh, the extension of inter-switching limits. Uh, the current inter-switching is uh, 30 miles or, or 50 kilometers, and uh, <clears throat> this uh, this gives the current, the way the current inter-switching is, um, there are four, four grain elevators in Western Canada that have natural competition between railroads. They sit on, um, on a point where the two railroads cross and, and they have access to both railroads. With the current inter-switching, uh, that extends uh, 
the, the co competition between railroads to 14 elevators. And with the extension of inner switching limits, uh, it extends it to 160 kilometers or 100 miles, uh, which moves the, the uh, competitive nature of our railroads to, uh, I believe it's 156 elevators in Western Canada out of the 330 uh, elevators that there are. Um, the, the Canadian Grain Commission will arbitrate grain contract disputes and uh, expedite and there will be an expedited review of the Canada, Canada or Canadian Transportation Act. Uh, this this uh, review was scheduled to take place in, in 2016 and uh, it, this this will bring it up much to uh, a much closer date to where we are now. Bill C-30 is being reviewed by the Standing Committee of Agriculture and, and Agri-Food and, uh, and it is also being reviewed by by both uh, Connect, the uh, Green Tr Crop Transportation Committee of uh, the Canadian Federation of Agriculture as well as uh, APAS, Keystone Ag Producers and Alberta Federation of Agriculture. Bill C-30 is a start but leads to more questions and answers. Who's going to ensure the equitable access across the system? Are these short or long-term measures? And also, will the CTA, CTA review include a full cost and review? Railroads uh, competition and export coordination is vital. Other issues that, that uh, APAS is, has been looking at on behalf of uh, Saskatchewan producers, uh, water policy. Um, the, the Water Security Agency has a, or had for the last six months, starting October 1st and running till the end of March, was an online discussion on, on drainage strategy and, and water drainage and, and uh, complaints and, and so on around water management. And that ran, uh, as I said, from October 1st to March 31st. There has been uh, a promised uh, um, uh, discussion period after this before any legislation come, or before any regulations are, are added. And, uh, and they, they have promised that, that uh, APAS and other, other uh, farm groups and, and, uh, and those that have and stakeholders will be involved in, in those discussions. Also, you will remember <coughs> that Dan Mazur, Vice President of the Keystone Egg Producers, invited APAS to, to join a, a, a group uh, that was started in Manitoba uh, around the Assiniboine watershed. To, to, uh, they invited us to represent Saskatchewan producers um, on this uh, uh, planning commission to, to uh, I guess work work around the the uh, the, the Assiniboine watershed, which includes the Assiniboine River, Coppell River, and and the Souris River, to to uh, try and get a handle on on water flows. And since 60 percent of the water comes out of Saskatchewan, they felt that that uh, um, Saskatchewan needed to be involved. And, and that Saskatchewan producers needed to be represented. Uh, there was a conference held on March 26th in Burden, Manitoba, uh, which, which uh, both uh, Cam, Cam Weed, chair of the Environment Committee, and, and myself uh, sat on uh, in, in on meetings, both uh, physical and, and conference calls. Um, to discuss whether whether this becomes a uh, if there's enough interest to become a, a, a permanent entity, or if this was just going to be a flash in the pan. Um, all indications are that that um, 
this is going to be uh, that there was enough interest from uh, Saskatchewan rural municipalities, Manitoba municipalities, uh, urban municipalities in Saskatchewan, uh, watershed authorities in Saskatchewan and Manitoba, that there was enough interest that we will be going ahead and APAS will continue to be representing Saskatchewan producers on that uh, uh, planning commission. Um, it was very unfortunate that the Water Security Agency chose not to be part of this um, um, uh, conference as well. Uh, SARM was, was not in attendance. Uh, business risk management programming, ag recovery, ag stability, and new crop insurance tools. Uh, we've been uh, representing producers' voices in, in the uh, disappointment about the cuts to agri stability and agri invest. Uh, it's unfortunate that, that uh, crop insurance coverages are lower, uh, but um, with lower grain prices <clears throat> uh, come, come the, uh, the lower coverages. Uh, there are some, some parts of the uh, crop insurance where, where cover, uh, crop yields have been increased because of uh, technological advances. And uh, so there are, there are positives and negatives from crop insurance. There are, there's also uh, some, some uh, looking at, at uh, private crop insurance and, and uh, uh, income insurance. And we're also looking at, at uh, ways to mitigate the, the, uh, the cuts in, in uh, two at the seed acres uh, because there are many acres around the, the province that, are, that continue to be flooded that are normally seeded uh, on an ongoing basis. Landowner surface rights, uh, as you remember last fall during our district meetings, we had the province come in to talk about, about uh, the, the, the Surface Rights Act from 1968 that they are looking at changing. And uh, we had uh, a representative from, from the uh, Ministry of the Economy as well as, as the uh, Al Alberta um, uh, Farmers Advocate to come in and talk about, about their system. And while we were having those meetings, um, we had calls from from uh, a number of RMs saying that our district meetings were too far from them. They were very interested and they would like to have uh, uh, other meetings happen in their area. Uh, as you'll see in a while, that our, our winter has been extremely busy. So we finally got around to having these meetings, uh, public meetings. Uh, we, we scheduled two more. One was held uh, last week, April 2nd in Marsden. And uh, another one is, is uh, tentatively scheduled for April 30th in Mooseman. Uh, under grains and oil seeds policies, uh, we're looking at, at uh, better grain contracts for producers. We've looked at this for a number of years, knowing that, that contracts are one-sided, uh, that there are no teeth in these uh, contracts for, for producers or on the producer side. They're all on the grain uh, company side. And so we're looking at, at, at a more fair and, and balanced uh, grain contract for producers. Uh, Oil-based price premiums for canola. Uh, we, we got protein con or premiums for wheat. Uh, why can't we have uh, oil-based premiums for, for canola. As, as um, certain years we have, have more protein than other years, uh, so, so is that in, in canola. The, the base price for canola, for oil in canola, is at 40.5%. Uh, 40, 40 and uh, many years we are producing oil in the, the 45, 46, and, and even higher. So that is... Um, uh, basically a premium 
that the oil crushers are, are extracting out of us uh, at, at no cost to them. Uh, and also research funding that best leverages producers' investments. And um, or we continue to work on that. Some other issues um, that, that we have been working on through the year, uh, it hasn't been just transportation, it hasn't been just grains and oil seeds, but we've been working on a number of other issues. As you can see, livestock insurance, uh, the, the porcine uh, disease in pork production, uh, hedging coverage, uh, just uh, a, a different way of, of uh, securing profits for, for livestock producers, but hopefully moving that to, to grain producers as well. Uh, crop insurance changes, uh, Bill C-18, cash advance changes, uh, UPOB 91, varietal registration, species at risk, taxation issues. Uh, just some of the issues that, that uh, we've been dealing with, shall we say, in our spare time, uh, but on a regular basis. Um, it's it's uh, something that's always on our, or some things that are always on our table and, and uh, we need to deal with on your behalf. We've had a very busy winter in, in, uh, for retention. Uh, Bruce Dodds, our, our field man uh, and, and coordinator of, of uh, recruitment and retention activities, uh, has been our lead all, all winter. Uh, he's included uh, the executive board members and some of you reps in, in recruitment activities. Uh, or shall I say retention activities and and now more recently in recruitment activities uh, retention was was our our foremost uh, activity making sure that we we're able to keep the, the members that we have and now that we've visited the majority of, of or all of our uh, current members we are starting to focus more and more on recruitment and to date, we have uh, five, five new members. We have a number of others that said, yes, we are joining, but we won't be including them until we get the paperwork and, and check in hand. So welcome to uh, Grassy Creek, number 78, Webb 138, Wood Creek 281, Humboldt 370, and Tisdale number 427. And we foresee a number of other new RMs coming on board as well. We have recently added a couple of new uh, member benefits to, uh, to our, our list of, of member benefits. The first one I want to talk about is the Chrysler Fleet Program, which was announced uh, in July of 2013. Uh, and this uh, program was uh, dedicated to the 2013 and 2014 models. We see it as, as giving great value to our producers. Uh, and we are working with Chrysler to make the process more consistent across the province. As there are some Chrysler dealers that do not deal a whole bunch with fleet programming, they are struggling to, to uh, understand fleet programming. And, and uh, so we, we need to work with them, or I guess Chrysler needs to work with them. We need to work with Chrysler to ensure that everybody is on the same same path and and uh, allowing um, our producers to uh, reap the benefits of, of this program. Uh, and, and if anybody has any concerns, let let your APAS director, rep, or phone the office and talk to our staff. Let us know because we need to make this available to everybody. And uh, we're currently working on um, a new program for the 2015 uh, uh, Chrysler products. Cooperators, it, the, the Cooperators Insurance Company is, is our most recent uh, program that we're working on. APAS is a new, is the most recent owner member of, of the Cooperators. And uh, over the coming months, uh, we'll be we'll be able to announce some some cost competitive 
and cost uh, benefit products to our, our members and our member RMs. Uh, and the definition of those two, our members are, are the uh, individual rate payers within the RMs and hopefully there will be some, some products that we can offer to the RMs themselves uh, uh, for, for their use. So that brings me to the end of my presentation. Um, we've got uh, some, some uh, uh, time for, for questions and I will turn the floor back to, uh, to Don to uh, run you through the, the process for, for questions. Thank you, Norman. <clears throat> that was a very good presentation uh, about how the Green Pipeline dilemma has unfolded and how APAS has vigorously pressed home the impact on producers and rural communities to governments and other stakeholders. Of course, among aside from grain transportation, you obviously were de dealing with a number of other issues in the last uh, four months since the AGM. So uh, you definitely have a lot on your plate. Now we will have questions and answers from webinar participants. Viewers have the option to ask your questions by raising your hand. This can, can be accomplished by clicking on the hand on your computer screen and Brenda will cancel the mute function so you can ask your question at the appropriate time. Another option is to use your keyboard to type your questions. We will gladly accept either form of questions. So uh, while we're waiting for the first question, um, from our webinar participants. Uh, Norm, I, I think it's uh, with, the, with the green situation, with the green backlog we've had so far, uh, we're not sure how many months it'll take to get to back to normal. Um, given what you've heard from the railways and the government, um, and given the fact that we may I have at least a normal crop, if not a better crop, this, this coming spring. So how long do you think it will take us to get back to what I would call a normal situation for the green movement? Well, Don, the, the, the current numbers that, that uh, the railroads are supposed to be moving at, at a million tons per week, um, since they're already about six million to seven million tons behind their their own plan. Um, it's going to take six or seven weeks uh, to move that that tonnage. But there are still other tonnage that that uh, was scheduled to, to be moved in this time frame that that needs to be moved. So we're looking at a minimum of six to seven weeks into the new crop year just to move this year's crop. And six to seven weeks into the new crop year takes us to the end of September when a lot of new crop is normally being moved as well. So minimum, if, if the railroads can continue a million tons per week for the next, let's say, year, we might be caught up to the uh, where we should be. But with that said, the grain companies are going to be backing off on some of their sales uh, to be so that they're not running as far behind anymore either. So we, we, uh, we're easily going to be looking at, at the 12-month the period coming up to, uh, to get back to normal. Um, and and maybe even further. So in, in other words, uh, it's, it's clearly not a quick fix. It's not even going to be fixed this coming summer. It's going to be next next year at least. Uh, Easily. Because yeah. I was talking to producers last week, and they've been had their grain in the bin for probably six months, and it's going to be there for a little while yet. Yeah. So, so I guess one thing we should mention here is take care of your grain because that, that's your asset, that's your income. Make sure it's in good shape because, as, as you just said, it may be there for quite a while now. That's a very good point, Norm, because you need to keep that quality uh, right where it is right now without deteriorating. Yeah. We have a question. Uh, the question is, what is the plan to accommodate producer car users? 
Well, um, according to to uh, uh, now I don't remember the name off the top of my head, but uh, according to uh, numbers that we've seen, producer cars uh, this year, there's been orders for a little over 17,000 producer cars, and uh, according to uh, Mark Hemis from Quorum, there has been 12,000 of those cars delivered. So we are at almost record pace according to to the, the numbers that have been given by the railroads. So um, uh, what is the plan to accommodate? Uh, I guess continue at where we are and just uh, uh, make sure that if, if there are issues around producer cars, let us know so that we can uh, advocate on your behalf. Because uh, if, if I remember hearing right, uh, Lonnie McCabe, who, who was at the uh, transportation forum, uh, was part of the, the uh, Canadian Producer Car Association. Uh, I believe that association has gone defunct now. And uh, uh, so there, there needs to be somebody to advocate for producer car shippers. And uh, if we need to be that voice, we, we will be. Great, Norm. Uh, like you said, everybody's in the same boat right now, including producer car users. So yeah. There's another question that was put in here on the Internet, it's, and the question is, what percentage what percentage of wheat is being stored in plastic grain bags and how long before that grain is considered too spoiled to ship? Uh, can't answer the first part. Uh, no idea on, on uh, how much is in grain bags. Uh, it varies in, in different areas. Uh, over the last month, I know, or I guess six weeks, I know I've seen a, an awful lot of, of uh, extractors out in the field moving, moving those, that product, whether it's into bins or, or uh, into the elevators. Uh, as you know, grain bags are a short-term short option for storage. Um, there is, there is a, a best before date, and I guess depending on, on what kind of wildlife you have in your area, whether the ravens have pecked through and, and maybe the coons and deer have got in there as well, um, that's another thing. You need to be vigilant at watching that if your grain is in, in the grain bags. But there is a best before date, and uh, it should be either checked or moved or whatever to uh, keep it in condition. Very true. Uh, over the over the winter months, uh, I think it's not a problem to keep it in good condition, but now with the uh, temperature going up, um, that may may deteriorate, uh, depending, as you said, if, if the bag's been has any holes in there or whatever. Yep, yeah, exactly. I'm just wondering if anyone has any questions on the conference call line. So I'm just wondering if anyone is there on the conference call line who would like to ask a question. Okay, while well, we're waiting for that, uh, but yeah, by all means, Brenda raise, raise the option. If you want to ask a question, please do so. I'd just like to go back to the green side again. My understanding is that Pulse Canada has gotten some federal money and they're involved in a review as well. Do you have any, any information about that or where they're at at the, at the present time? Yes, uh, that was one of the organizations that, that we met with when we were in Ottawa. Uh, their office is in Winnipeg, but uh, uh, they came to Ottawa to meet with us. Uh, it was Gordon Bacon and, and Greg Truitt from, from uh, Pulse Canada. And they they set set a person aside, Greg Sherwood, to work on transportation only. And Greg's been working at that for the past seven years. And they they've seen the deficiencies in, in our grain handling system, uh, our grain transportation system. And and they've been they've been trying to to uh, change change the reporting system. Um, of, of the grain transportation, and they they had a uh, an application in for for funding to do some more work, um, and 
in mid-January, Minister Rince announced that uh, that uh, Pulse Canada, uh, along with with some other partner groups, would be receiving 1.5 million dollars to be matched by by those organizations to do some further work on on uh, uh, the transportation reporting system and and uh, um, and so that that's the funding that they received. The funding was to be uh, uh, done over over a five year period, uh, but in discussions with Pulse Canada, it's it's looking like they want to get that funding or that that uh, the work done in in uh, a much shorter time, uh, closer to the three year period, and so they. Uh, um, that's the direction they'll be going uh, in, in the short term. Okay, thanks, Norm. Um, got another question here. It's um, the question is: Where are we now with the banks, crop insurance, and other financials as far as extending payment periods? Um, as you know. Uh, FCC had, had extended their their uh, payment timeline on on, uh, on crop input loans, and and they had said if if you're needing to go past that timeline, that they would be um, willing to to uh, use use the the uh, inventory in the bins as as security to to give you a short term loan. Um, to pay off your your uh, crop input loan, uh, <clears throat> so that that crop input um, money would be available for this year's inputs. A um, number number of other financial institutions, banks, and credit unions are are uh, doing the same. There are some other firms on the outside that are are giving other options, um, whether it be uh, uh, input contracting. Um, crop contracting, uh, just just to free up uh, more cash for producers, and um, and there was there was another part of that question. Uh, well, I talked. Oh, crop insurance. Crop insurance. Yeah. Um, oh, I guess I sh I should mention cash advance. Uh, there. Are there are some changes coming down in, in Bill C-18, but uh, nothing nothing to, to the effect of, uh, that, that we were looking at. We've talked to the federal minister a number of times about extending the payment plan or payment time frame. He is not uh, uh, committed. He said he can do it if he, if he wants, but he is not committed to uh, to extending that payment plan as well. Um, um, oh, the the numbers that they were using as far as uh, as far as producers uh, using using the maximum numbers. Um, I believe there were normally there's about 12 percent of producers take cash advance. This year, it's it's uh, 33 percent, and uh, and of those, uh, 20 percent have reached the maximum of uh, of uh, the hundred thousand dollars interest-free advance, and uh, it's a very small percentage that have reached the maximum of four hundred thousand dollars. So they're they're struggling whether they want to. Do any extensions on on uh, or increases of payments? Okay. Um, there's a question. Well, there's two questions. Well, one the comment. There's a question. Well, I guess both questions. It says um, one gentleman wrote in and says, "Will these slides be available?" Uh, yes, they will be. Um, if you want, we can mail it out to uh, reps. Um, yeah, we can email it to, to reps and to directors. Uh, if that's required, but we certainly can do that. It's also being recorded, so you have the option just to review it uh, with the recording as well. So you have two ways to look at it. Um, so the other question is, um, it's just talking about uh, uh, any news on 
U2, U holes 91 or Bill C18? Um, Bill C18 is, is uh, legislation. And what it, what it will do um, is, is put, put these, uh, these points in, in legislation. What, what, uh, what will really be our concern is, is the regulations around them. Now, UPOV 91, Canada has been a signatory on, on UPOV 91 since 1991. But no government has has uh, has had the courage, shall I say, or or been able been able to bring it forward to to put it into legislation, and uh, so bringing it into legislation is one thing, but as I said, the the regulations around it is is where we're going to have the concern and and be able to have the input. Uh, it, we're fairly certain that Bill C-18 will be passed in this session. Um, uh, whether that it actually does happen or not, uh, we'll see. But uh, uh, that that is the, the government's plan to have it passed in in this session. Uh, so, what we will want to do in into the future. Is, is make sure that that we have input into the regulations, both in, on UPOV 91, varietal registration, and and the changes to, to crop insurance and, and uh, um, CFIA, the Canadian Food Inspection Agency. Great. Thanks, Norm. Uh, we have time for one more question, and if it's a quick question, then it's a short response. <laughs> You know me too well. <laughs> Anyone on the conference call? You're quiet as a mouse over there. Okay. Fair enough. Um, I think we should draw this to a conclusion. Um, therefore, uh, thank you again, Norm, for participating in our first webinar update. I appreciate your insights into transportation and other help issues relevant to staff and producers, I'm sure the viewers feel the same. Before handing the podium over, any last comments from you, Norm, at this time? Just to say that, um, as, as you, you saw in one of the earlier slides, um, we've, we've been tackling a number of issues, and, and we've had a fair bit of success in, in quite a number of them as well whether it was uh, taxation issues or, or uh, uh, crop insurance changes or, or whatever. But we cannot have a policy on, on some of these issues unless we have input from you. So get a hold of your director. Uh, if, you're a, if you're not a member, get a hold of your rep or director or, or uh, staff in the office. Get a hold of us. Let us know what you think, and uh, and uh, because better policy is made by greater information, and uh, that that's what we need to uh, create good policy and therefore good policy for for all. Thanks, Norm. We, we actually got a question as you were speaking. Um, maybe we'll slide this under the wire and get it in at the last last minute. Sure. But the impact is, or the question is, pardon me, what impact has APAS had in pro-farmer policy? Over the last year, uh, actually over the last couple of years, uh, our impact has been increasingly visible. Um, just one quick example. Um, starting in early January, the, the premier and, and uh, finance minister started lobbing some softballs out there, um, saying that maybe they should be raising the the uh, uh, education portion of property tax because they they needed you know, obviously more education money, uh, infrastructure money for for education and so on, um, and we told them in in that 
in one of the first meetings we had with them in uh, mid-January that at, uh, that this this was a non-starter in, in rural Saskatchewan. It took us 45 years to get this tax down to, to a, a, a manageable level and that we would not accept a tax increase. Uh, I, I emphasize that again in a letter to both the Premier and the Finance Minister. We were called into the Finance Minister's office. Again, we, we uh, reiterated that. And so it came out in, in the budget that there were no tax increases uh, anywhere except uh, in the SIN taxes. But more importantly, there was no tax increase on the education portion of property tax. So that is, that is one part where we, we, uh, we made it very clear and government listened. And there's, there's a number of other examples, but Don's looking at me. I'm out of time. So. <laughs> I wasn't looking at him, but he's right. We are out of time. But I appreciate it very much, Norm. Um, so, again, thank you for being with us this morning, and all the best in the upcoming growing season. You can go, go what you're meant to be on this earth, and that's produce crop for us overnight so we can eat some food. Yep. I appreciate that very much. Thank you, Don. Um, at the end of this webinar, you'll have a few short questions, and we appreciate your response to those questions because we want to find out, first of all, was this useful? And secondly, do you see some value in this, whether it's an hour long or a shorter version of an update? Uh, just like to get your feedback so we know which way to go because this is a, an important technology and we would like to make better use of it if possible. So please give us your feedback. We also, um, if anybody has any other questions, please uh, fax it into us or email it or whatever. Um, you got the fax number, you got the email address there. So if there are other questions, we would be happy to respond to those questions. Um, we will respond in a few business days and we post it on APAS website. So um, any questions, I'm sure other people are wondering about the same thing or, or have the same questions. So we again put it on our website. So we hope you enjoyed this hour with us. In closing, may your seating start soon. May sunshine and rain be provided as required. And above all else, please stay safe. This webinar concluded. Everybody have a great day. <laughs>